Okay, so uh, today I want to reflect on the way I use digital tools, not so much for um, final outputs, but as part of the practice of my research, um, which is a, you know, the idea of practice and research is a, is a kind of radical new thing for art historians like myself. Uh, so I, it's sort of something that the UK-based historian James Baker has called soft DH, DH, soft digital humanities, and I'm not, I'm not sure if I love the term, but it captures something about the importance of the process and the practice and the making of, of using these digital tools and methods rather than just focusing on the final outputs. Um, and, and, and I also want to, so I'm kind of reflecting on this para the, the paradigm shift for me, becoming more of a maker or, or striving to become more of a maker in the research that I do. Um, so it, you have a radical shift here because I work on Europe. Um, this is what I work on. I broadly describe my work nowadays, I think actually since coming to the ANU, I've, I've changed a idea of what I do a bit, to the history of the visual representation of landscape. So I used to think of myself more as a historian of gardens, but now I think of myself more as a historian of the representation of nature. So what role does the representation of nature play in the way that societies conceptualise the natural world, landscape, um, and so on? And so, so I, I look at everything from maps to, to constructed landscapes to representations of of real gardens to representations of imagined places, um, to set designs and performances within, um, within designed gardens. So one of the challenges for people who work on the history of gardens and landscapes is that the evidence is very fragmentary. It's ephemeral, it's changing, um, it's very rare, uh, especially when you're looking at gardens, to have a authentic, uh, I don't love that word, but an authentic, original version of a garden. They change over time. You're much more likely to have something um, a bit like this or something that's been reconstructed from this. And this is um, Venaria Reale near Turin. Uh, so I'm interested in the way that digital methods can help us to not reconstruct necessarily, but reimagine these places. Um, we either have ruins or if we have prints and drawings, we have something that is not a photograph. It's not a documentary piece of evidence. It's something created for a particular type of visual representation and often really created for an audience who may not have experienced the original place. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that gardens, we're particularly when we're talking about physical landscapes, is that they're three-dimensional spaces and they're very hard to understand um, in the abstract, in two dimensions. And so is there a way that we can um, draw on some of these digital techniques to recapture some of that? Um, yeah, so prints are, are made for a specific purpose. A print like this, which is for the uh, Medici in Florence, is made for an audience, really an audience, who was, who was never there, um, who never saw the original performance. Um, it's exaggerated for reasons of for want of a better word, propaganda, but it's also an attempt to capture a, a four or five hour performance with many different elements in a single image. And so how do you do that well? It's not by creating a kind of snapshot, it's by um, creating views from a high point and capturing lots of different um, horse ballets around the side. So, what are the digital methods that I'm using? And because I, this is a lightning talk, I don't have much time, I'm just going to look at two, sort of as a prompt, I guess, and to kind of explain where I'm coming from today. Um, so one is digital mapping. So this is a project that, that I think Mitch, I've been working on with Mitchell, we said before, it's a bit dormant. Um, and also another colleague, Lisa Bevan at The Trove, and this is looking at, at some 17th century maps that represent the landscape around Rome. Uh, as part of the process of working on this project, we geo-referenced them, so created layers so they would sit over um, modern maps. And I became um, Mitchell too, if I'm allowed to speak to him. We're interested in these discrepancies, often in the literature on geo-referencing, when you don't get a match, it's called an error. We thought, mm, we really hate this word, error. Um, and so we're interested in the way that the discrepancies of using this digital tool, using a method like georeferencing, actually prompt you to think about different visual representational systems. So why is this area so exaggerated? Why is the match so bad, for want of a better word? Well, it's because it's a, it's a very important site. And so its, it's uh, presence is exaggerated on the map. 
Um, another element of looking at these old maps and georeferencing in them and that I was struck by is that they show the landscape, they show nature. And that's something that's really absent from a lot of the maps that we use every day. So things like Google Maps tend to show the broader landscape as sort of just blank, um, maybe green, um, but often just like empty space, privileging the kind of human civilization, the urban, over nature. And that's something that is, is very striking when you start to build these layers. And that, that comparison between what is not what is wrong with the old map, but what is absent from our modern maps is also a fascinating thing for me. Um, and so my second, oh, I've got like um, 25 seconds. Um, this, <laughs> the second thing that I'm really interested in is this kind of reconstruction of lost spaces. Now that I'm cheating a bit here, this is not a lost space, it's the Bob Lee Amphitheatre. Um, and I will wrap up in a second and skip that one. And so I'm interested in how I might reimagine these spaces using overlays and prints to try and capture something of the kind of lost space. And I will wrap up. So I have